Vittorio Colau spent a decade as chief executive at Vodafone, growing it into one of the world's biggest telecoms companies. He's radically reshaped the business during his tenure, pulling back in the US and betting on Europe. Part of the transformation included making the company's biggest ever deal, a much anticipated 18 billion euro takeover of Liberty Global's German and Eastern European assets. Today, on Leaders with L'Aqua, we meet Vittorio Colau. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of time. What do you think defines you as a leader? People would tell you that uh, I'm defined by a passion for uh, uh, being in the trenches, kind of. I love products, I love uh, uh, the operations. Uh, one of the best emails that I have received when I announced that I would step down was from a colleague in New Zealand, uh, a customer care colleague who remembers that years ago I've been listening into customer calls next to him for half an hour and he thought I was a, an inspector and he didn't realize who I was. So this type of thing, be next to where the action is, which usually is next to the customers. And what was the hardest decision you've ever made? And do you remember if it was a guiding principle that actually made you go forward, or was it a business case? One that I remember not... Well, the hard decision has been definitely to negotiate very hard with Apple when they wanted to give the iPhone, the first iPhone, in exclusivity to only one operator per country. We negotiated very hard, and at some point they were asking what we thought was too much and uh, we had to make the decision to just let it go. But I have to tell you it was hard because we knew that it would have been a big success. And so, but again, at the time, did you reach to a point where you said, yes, this is my price limit? Or did you think, you know, I'm, I'm open to possibility, like I can, I can let it go at any time? I, I, I think, if, I, if I'm honest, the, the, the ball was in Steve Jobs' hands, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not so sure how much uh, we made the decision or he made a decision, but uh, I would say we had clear limits. We are a fairly disciplined company. We are very British. We are very financially uh, savvy, and we knew that beyond a certain point, it would have been uh, probably uh, not a good idea. Nonetheless, we wanted to have it because, again, staying close to customers, staying close to, you know, distribution dealers. I knew that it would have been a, a, an important thing, but, you know, we, we decided that there was only a, a certain limit, and beyond that we didn't go. But it was a tough decision. Um, you were at Vodafone for 20 years. What is the thing that you've learned the most about the telecoms industry? How's it changed? It has changed in many ways. We uh, we used to be a, a essentially a metered service, almost a luxury service. Uh, I remember when uh, back in the early days when I when I when I started the, uh, the company that today is Vodafone Italy, when you know you would use only a certain amount of minutes and know that it was cheaper in the night and more expensive during the day and the weekend for free. This type of continuous thinking of when you should use this wonderful thing which was a mobile device a and now we are in the world of practically unlimited seamless use I, I, I'm not sure if anybody in the world is using their devices when they sleep but I'm sure somebody is thinking of how to make them use the devices when they sleep and this has changed completely because we have become a, a volume business we have become a scale business uh, at some point convergence has arrived so now we need to put you know distribute data everywhere you are and whether it's a big screen a small screen a medium screen mobility non-mobility it's seamless and this is a big change from this kind of luxury uh, uh, benefit that you know in the early days we were but so does it mean that also the challenges for the telecoms business has changed is it pricing what do you focus the, on the obvious challenge is that when you go into this massive volume games uh, you, on one hand, uh, need to work very hard on costs, so to be sure that because, of course, with, uh, uh, I give you an example, data traffic uh, is increasing 60-70%, so you use your mobile device 60-70% more this year than last year, whatever was your usage level, and you don't give us 60-70% more every year, so we need to work on costs to be sure that we... And on the other hand, we need to remain relevant, and we need to not be commoditized when, you know... Uh, when you eat one uh, uh, chocolate, uh, it's, a, it's a specialty. When you eat a, eat a lot of bread, it becomes bread. So how to maintain the differentiation when the, the volume is so high is clearly the other challenge. So are, are you saying that I use 60% more data every year? Every year. But every so what's year. the limit? 
It's a, it's a question that we keep asking ourselves. Uh, uh, if I look at our markets today, you have people he, markets where people use two, three uh, uh, gigabytes per month, and markets where they use 11, 12, and then you have customers who use 25, and this is mobile. But then in fixed, when we started fixed broadband into the homes, we used, I don't know, 25, 30 gig per month. Now with Netflix, with uh, BBC iPlayer, with all the you know, content entertainment, you're talking about 250, 250, 300. So it's 10 times more than 10 years ago. So uh, I think we, and, and we are all in that trend because of course we are going digital, we use the cloud, we put our documents in the, in the, in the cloud. I uh, recently, uh, I realized that uh, uh, I don't need to take with me all my papers because I just had to put them into, into the cloud. And then if I need my driving license for ri renting a car or something, I can just show it like this. And they take it. And this is the magic. Coming up, talking telecoms. Vittorio Colau walks us through the changing landscape in the sector and the biggest obstacles to growth. Italian businessman Vittorio Colau has been an executive in the telecoms business for more than 20 years. In that time, he's contended with huge changes in the regulatory landscape, from the end of roaming charges in Europe to transformations in the way data needs to be handled. What kind of leadership does it take to keep telecoms profitable in this changing environment? What comes next? Is it driverless cars? Or is the telecom industry going to be so ingrained that actually anything we do in the future, they'll be part of it? Yeah, what comes next is really uh, the biggest change is going to be in the next, let's say, five years probably, four or five maybe, uh, the uh, introduction of 5G and uh, the spreading of fiber to reach uh, the, uh, the, the, the customers. This will imply that we go down with to, to, to a latency, which is the delay that the signal takes to get to a place probably below 10 milliseconds. And this will enable de facto almost instantaneous connections. And you can start thinking about what is called the Internet of Things. You think about, yeah, of course, driverless cars, but also uh, industrial systems managed from remote, but also logistics, transportation, everything seamlessly connected. Uh, which is the next uh, uh, the next uh, world, the world of everything connected and uh, w with a lot of savings, a, a huge environmental opportunity, mm -hmm. I think, because we will waste much less, of course, some challenges, cybersecurity being the biggest. I mean, are you ever scared of it because of cybersecurity? No, I'm not scared. I'm never scared. Why should I be scared, Francine? Oh, well, because <laughs> if you have a key that I connects to, to your phone, that connects to it, hacking is a danger. Yeah, but, you know, also breaking into your home is a danger, and there's people who can open a car or, or, uh, or, a, or, or, a, or an apartment door in three seconds anyhow today. So then the problem is how do you make sure that this does not happen easily? What are the defense? We have invested as Vodafone a lot in... Uh, uh, in, 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 in people who dedicate their life to defending the systems. And of course, the other side, which I think Europe, uh, quite frankly, got it right earlier than the rest of the world, is privacy, is e-privacy, GDPR, all the legislation that is aimed really at forcing companies to be safe. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I think, uh, again, initially the reaction was, oh, this is bureaucracy in Europe. In reality, it's uh, a law that is shaping the world. So. Let's go into the future, but let's go into the future with the right protections. And, and I want to come back on to regulation, but if you just talk to me a little bit about some of the huge divestments that you've done, the yeah. huge acquisitions, what was the most difficult deal? Well, I, I would say we, we, we had many. From, from, a, from a decision-making point of view, of course, Verizon Wireless was a, a, a big one. And, you know, the situation was either we merge the two companies or we split. So either we get married or we divorce. And uh, I, we have played with both ideas for a while, and then, you know, in a famous evening, the then CEO of Verizon, Lowell McAdam, came to my home. We had a wonderful discussion, wonderful dinner, and we discussed all the options and everything else. And then uh, on, uh, on the way out, he gave me a big hug, a big un-American hug. Americans <laughs> don't like hugging like we like, like we Italians like. And he, he said to me, you have a wonderful family. And that's the moment where I understood that he meant uh, 
we are divorcing. <laughs> and so then we negotiated. And, uh, but that hug for me uh, made it clear that it was time to, uh, to just have independence. That was difficult. And, for, and it was it difficult for you well, to realize that Well, it's difficult because it's big. It's, uh, but, you know, then there was a big negotiation, and, you know, then that's history, and it was a $130 billion cash sale. It was big, but I would say the decision was an important one. Yeah. The negotiation itself was, okay. The complicated one has been the whole set of discussions with uh, Liberty. We are now becoming, after this deal, the biggest fixed broadband provider in Europe. Now, if you think of Vodafone, we were born as mobile and consumer, and we end up being the f largest fixed broadband provider in Europe. So it's a big transformation. We made many steps. And with Liberty, we had many attempts and many steps and many deals, and we have a joint venture in the Netherlands. So it has been a long, uh, a long process. I mean, the deal with Liberty is really your baby. Do you feel bad having left Vodafone before seeing it through? I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it is my baby. I mean, my baby is the transformation in 10 years from as I said, mobile consumer into the new thing. And my, if you want, contribution has been the reshaping of the company, the selling the minorities, getting out of China, getting out of the US, concentrating on Europe uh, and Africa and bulking up okay. the assets there. Uh, liberty is one step. Do I feel bad? Listen, uh, CEO, CEO is, uh, is a captain of a ship, does a piece of the journey, and then another one takes the next, uh, the next leg. And that's the way it should be. Is there a danger that regulators don't really understand the, you know, the, um, the, the big companies, basically, the big tech companies or the big telecom companies? Sometimes it's so difficult even for the companies to understand the impact that they're having or wh how they're processing data. The, there, is, uh, there is that risk, which is why I'm advocating a more intense and a more productive uh, dialogue between companies, businesses, and policymakers and regulators. Because the speed of technology is such that, you know, who knows really the outcome. Think about the voice assistants, the Amazon Alexa, the, the, the Google, the OK Google, or, the, uh, or, or Cortana, or all these things. What these assistants can do is limitless. You can apply that to plenty of domains. And some of these things will be fantastic for the citizens, for the users. Now, the implications we don't fully understand. We don't fully understand what happens to privacy, what happens to family life, what happens, look at social networks. Social networks are a good thing, but for sure they have some negative aspects on youth. So we, we need to be quicker at adjusting, and the old way of regulating before with rules that don't cover everything it doesn't work anymore. We need to be faster in changing and a little bit more open to each other. But again, where does that come from? Because th there is a danger that actually regulation is also backward looking, right? So that the technology Absolutely. has moved on, social media has moved on, and so you're regulating things of the past. Absolutely. And that's why I think that the competition commissioner, European Competition Commissioner Vesta, when she talks about changing uh, regulatory frameworks into more dynamic framework and not static, she's right. Because we need to look forward, we need to accept more experimentation and quicker intervention if something goes wrong, rather than three-year cycles to have new rules and then they are valid for five years. That's the past. Technology doesn't wait. I mean, should regulators across the world work together? It seems that Europe is, is uh, many times actually at the forefront of this. I think regulators should talk to each other more, also because there is another aspect. If you think about it, uh, uh, technology doesn't really know what the concept of a border is. And border is linked to jurisdiction. Of course, jurisdictions are important, and we need to respect jurisdictions. But if something cannot be done here, but can be done here, and there is a seamless digital link, you know, by definition, this regulation is in unimpactful. Again, what Europe has done, for example, on copyright and journalism and all these things, is you know an example of what should be debated because you cannot have different approaches in the world. But again, I'm an advocate for a tighter, better debate mm -hmm. rather than the stick of the carrot and the big stick as the regulation, we need to debate more. Okay, so w what kind of regulation would you do, for example, for the Internet of Things? Is it data protection or is it intellectual property protection? Uh, I, think, I think you need to, to, to have both. Yeah. You need to protect uh, intellectual property and you need to allow economic exploitation. If I invent uh, the next uh, driverless car or the next thing, I need to be able to benefit from it. But we need also to find a way to use data in aggregate for social good. I give you an example. If I cross here the river, you know, certain times of the day and with a certain vehicle, one time with a bicycle, one time with a car, 
it's an important information for people who have to plan the roads, for people who have to plan transportation. And while I want to protect my privacy, I also am happy if the City of London you know, is managed in a better way. And the same applies to health. I want to protect my health data. But at the end of the day, if this watch tells uh, uh, my doctor uh, how my heart is going and the data uh, pseudonymized in the right way is used to improve uh, heart treatment, heart disease treatment, I'm happy also. So we need to find this common ground between intellectual property protection and common good and work together to make it compatible. Now, technology allows this, mm. but of course it's complicated. It's neither wh white nor black. Up next, the importance of diversity. We talk of Vittorio Colau's big push to make the workplace a more equitable place for women. Diversity has been a priority during Vittorio Colau's decade at Vodafone. The company rolled out a global maternity leave policy and launched what it says is the world's largest program to recruit women who have taken a career break. But he isn't just pushing for change at his company. As part of the UN's equality campaign, Vodafone has committed to expanding access to tech as tools of female empowerment around the globe. You've tried to fix diversity at Vodafone, but also on a wider scale. Why? You know, there is, um, th there is one thing that I always found irritating when uh, people talk about diversity. And it's this story that many consulting companies, many specialists say companies should really promote diversity because there is a business case, because uh, you make more money, because uh, diverse companies make better decisions, because whatever. And I always say this is a very utilitarian type of argument. So I do it because I make more money, I do it because the company is stronger, I do it because I have a return. And I, I was really irritated by it because I think it, it, it's wrong. I think we should do things because are right sometimes. Because I could make the opposite case. What if I find an environment, a country, where actually having women is not a smart thing from a profit point of view? What if I find that there is a country where discrimination actually is good or apartheid is good? Think about you know, South Africa and the history. So if I can make the opposite case, does that make exclusion right? Does this make uh, discrimination right? No, of course not. So I, I decided I will go for the right thing and it's a little bit philosophical or may maybe there is a bit of principles behind and I said we have to do the right thing and to be honest personally I worked at McKinsey uh, in my earlier part of my life it was dominated by essentially white middle-aged men in white shirts and uh, and red ties and then I went into what today is Vodafone Italy which was a startup now when you are in a startup you don't give a damn about the gender of people you want good people and you have no money and you need to get results and guess what we ended up in a wonderful diverse men women young I mean age was irrelevant. So that contrast convinced me, and this was really the, 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 second part, the, the second part of the 90s, convinced me that it was worth fighting because it was right, and honestly also because it was more fun. But why are we still talking about diversity, and in sometimes quotas, or in sometimes you know, yeah. how to retain talent, women, or yeah. um, you know, d difference in 2018? Quotas are uh, Quotas are fine as long as they are interpreted as objective, aspirational objectives or, or targets, if you want. But what I don't like of quotas is that very often we are very simplistic. We say 30% of the board or 35% of the top team. It's the whole pyramid that has to be filled. If we don't fill the pipeline, I, I always say, you know, you can have women in the top floors, but if we don't have women in the elevator, sooner or later... And actually, if you look at some countries, the Nordic countries actually, they have a lot of women in boards and in top positions, but they don't have really women in the companies. So is this what we want? Of course, it's part of what we want, but it's not what we want. What we want is to have fairness and equality. Yeah. So rather than quality, rather than targets, I prefer quality processes in hiring. So now we want every process to have a woman considered, even if we don't hire 
we want a senior person always to interview, just to teach the junior person. Now, we don't overrule decisions, I don't, but we want a senior person to teach a junior person how you look at diversity. A and it will take maybe another what, 15 years, or, or what, but, but, but we are moving, and the important thing is to keep the pressure for the whole pyramid to improve. Is there something at Vodafone that you've implemented that you thought was pretty successful in, in uh, you know, retaining talent? Is it cutting down meetings? Is it maternity leave? Is it something else? I think it's a combination of two things. One, some policies. So we had maternity leave. We have returning mothers policies. So, policies, so we hire people who have been out of uh, the job because of maternity period, and they come back into the workforce maybe three, maybe five years later. Uh, we have, of course, some forms of flexible working and remote working, all the classic things that you would expect a company, a telecom company to have. And so that is clearly part of the, uh, uh, of the things. But at the end of the day, I really believe that uh, a strong intervention from every layer of the hierarchy on the layer below on the decision-making process, which at the end are remuneration, promotions, and unfortunately sometimes demotions and firing, intervention from the top to really be sure that there is no um, uh, unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think in our company we have a deliberate bias, but unconscious bias are there. I am full of unconscious biases, and I am a he for she champion and all the mm -hmm. nice things that you know some people say about me, but I know that I have biases. There are certain uh, you know, styles that naturally influence me. Now, I try to control it, but I'm not sure I really control it. So I need another person to tell me. But so how, is it through training also? Yeah, we did a lot of training, a lot of videos. We have some very funny videos of uh, uh, stereotypical but very, uh, very um, strong situations where people misbehave or behave with bias or use words, for example, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, another topic but is not unrelated, LGBT. Mm -hmm. Words or expressions that to most people mean nothing but to a specific segment mm -hmm. of people actually could be you know, harmful or they hurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or maybe even even uh, uh, non-racist but racial-based comments, mm -hmm. which might be not considered racist, but still you can. And again, mm -hmm. talking. In my, I, I'm a great uh, fan of talking. So I always say, guys, if I say something wrong, just tell me immediately. Don't just keep it for yourself. You tell me, I say yes, no. And even if I say no, I understand that there is a problem. So we, we are a company that talks a lot about these things. And we and we cross uh, we cross challenge each other, but we are still a long way. Eh? We are not there. Even us. I mean, we are still at below thirty percent, and we struggle to to accelerate. Vittorio Colau, thank you so much. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.